tonight to 1 Peter in chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1 is where we are going to be. Started this a couple of weeks ago, and we didn't necessarily start in 1 Peter. We started uh, really in the Gospel of John, speaking about Peter and giving us some background to where Peter had to get to, or come from rather, uh, to get to where God used him in writing both First Peter and Second Peter, and certainly being a help uh, to those folks that he uh, wrote this to. First Peter chapter number one, and uh, we're going to start reading in verse number one, if you're able to, if you'd stand and honor the reading of God's word tonight, First Peter one and verse number one. Really the idea, and find it really the, the title, uh, the idea for the title in verse number three. We're going to start reading in verse number one. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now, for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, Ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. What a tremendous passage of Scripture. So much here to unpack. Lord, grateful for your word, just how it ministers to our heart. Just even the reading of it ought to be an encouragement to us and, and help us understand the hope that lies within us if we've trusted in Christ grateful for that. Lord, we, we live in this world and it can be difficult at times. In fact, often it is difficult for people who believe in what the Bible says and we understand what your word says. Lord, it's difficult for us to see the events around us and not get totally discouraged and not, not uh, kind of lose hope, if you will. But we're thankful that just like these folks in the day and time in which First Peter or First Peter's written when Peter wrote to them, Lord, they went through difficult times and certainly struggles. And so thank you for encouraging them. And by encouraging them, you've also encouraged us. Help us to take that encouragement. And Lord, may we share it with others. We'll be grateful. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. I read a statement this week. I thought it was just a tremendous thought. And thinking about the world in which we live, especially even the, the events of this past week and really how discouraging those things can be and how different pundits and talking heads want to twist it and turn it in different directions. And certainly I think we've seen that. If you watch the news much, and if you do, I don't understand why, but uh, if you watch it, you, you know that uh, things can be turned in any way, really, or it seems like it's turned in any way. But you just think about the events themselves, and certainly I think we, we live in perilous times and, and difficult times, and I think the world in which we live is a hostile world. Uh, I, I don't think many or any of us would really doubt or, or uh, um, kind of argue against that. But the, the, the person who wrote this quote didn't write it in this past week. They wrote it years ago, but here's what the, the writer said. He said, how we fare in this battle, that is in this Christian life, in this walk that we are in, in this world, how we fare in this battle will be determined by how well we are prepared. I think that's very true. How we fare in this battle, how we, we make out in this life, in, in, in the, the, the walk of Christianity, so to speak, our conversation of life, is very well determined by how we, well we are prepared. Are we prepared to face what we are facing? Are we 
looking at the events of the world and the day and time in which we live, are we looking at these things from a Bible perspective and from the understanding that our God, our Heavenly Father, knows all of this and certainly is ultimately in control of all of these things? Do we approach it from that? Or are we um, worried at every twist and turn that seems to come about? Now, if you don't live your life according to the Bible, you're going to get worried. <laughs> What time is it right now? In about two minutes, because something else is going to happen in this world. It's just, that's, that's how it's going to be. But what Peter is doing is he's writing to these people who, by the way, they weren't uh, enjoying a great or a grand time in life. Rather, these people that Peter is writing to are being uh, persecuted. They're, they're, they're on the run, so to speak. They've been scattered about because of the faith in which they, they are living their life is being... Um, looked upon as being something that is hazardous to society, <laughs> hazardous to the, the kingdom and, and the realm in which these people were living, the day and time in which they lived. And so because of that, the authorities were coming down upon them or searching them out, and not just, by the way, the governmental authorities, the religious authorities were coming down on them and, and uh, looking to take even their lives. In fact, uh, Saul, who we understand to be the Apostle Paul, was one of those who was sent out by the, the, the Jewish religious leadership to arrest and even to put to death people of the Christian persuasion. Just amazing, amazing thoughts. And that's who Peter is writing to here in First and even in Second Peter. I read another statement, I thought it was interesting, that the free way to failure is always smooth and downhill. Think about that. The freeway to failure is always smooth and downhill, but the road to success is a winding uphill dirt path. The freeway to failure is always smooth downhill. It always seems to be a broader way. More people seem to be on it. In fact, I think I read that somewhere. Oh yeah, the Bible says that. But the road to success is a winding uphill dirt path. Now, I don't believe for one minute the author is saying that, well, if you just try your best, if you just work hard, if you avoid the little obstacles on the way, if you stay on the path, then, then eventually you'll end up and God will reward your faithfulness and you will end up in heaven. No, no. I, I understand the Bible to say and to tell me that the way of salvation has already been paid for me by Jesus Christ on the cross. It's my acceptance of that, my understanding of my sin, my, my agreement with God about my sin, my confession of that is the word that the Bible uses, and then my requesting His forgiveness that only He can offer. Um, we read in the Gospels how the question is asked, who can forgive sins but God? <laughs> well, that's a good question, because no one can. I, I might uh, like Brother Tim, and I appreciate Brother Tim, and, and um, get to speak with him often, but um, if I sin, and I go to Brother Tim and say, Brother Tim, I want you to forgive my sin. I said a bad word that I shouldn't have said. Do you know how powerless that is? <laughs> he can't do anything about it. Now, he might want to. Pastor, I wish I could do something, but I, I can't. No, no. My salvation has already been purchased by Jesus Christ at Calvary. I've accepted that. I've put my full weight, my trust on Christ. And because of that, the Bible says he's forgiven my sins and saved my soul. Praise the Lord. But there is a way that I should be living my life. Because of what Jesus has already done for me, then that should bring me to the point where I say, wow, this has already been won for me. This is what Jesus wants me to do. He says I'm supposed to be holy as, as he is holy. And so because of what he's already done, I want to live my life and I'm, I'm motivated by that to live my life. I'm not motivated by some preacher spouting off or spitting all over me. I'm not motivated by that because then I can just find another church where the guy doesn't spit as bad as this one does. Or I could be motivated by Jesus Christ and his love for me. And the way that I live my life should be a narrow path, so to speak. I should be different from the world in which I live. And certainly these people in 1 Peter were, 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 were living in such a way that caused other people to dislike them or even hate them because of their faith, because of their belief. And so the persecution is coming on them. They are scattering then abroad. Okay, question. Then let's see how well we will apply this morning's message to the context of 1 Peter. Did God know that was going to happen? <laughs> yes. 
Do you think that it could have been part of God's plan and will and purpose that persecution came so that these people would spread out, go other places? Yes, yes. Do you think that um, God goes with them when they do that? Yes, yes, there's no question about it. Now, I, I can't demand or expect that this Christian life, this journey, so to speak, is going to be easy. In fact, as I even casually read the Bible, I, I understand that, that my walk as a Christian is into the wind, so to speak. It, it seems to be always uphill. There's always this, this, this battle that is taking place in my life. But I can understand that I am on the right road. And though I might not see all those rewards come to fruition right now, I can understand that the Bible says there are rewards that are coming that are eternal in nature. Now, as you think about 1 Peter then, 1 Peter, and, and many would say this, not just uh, uh, the ones that I might read, but many commentators, many Bible scholars would, would call 1 Peter the epistle of living hope. And really that idea, idea again is taken out of verse number three because it sets a hope for the believer in the midst of the world in which they live. Now, this was first century. We live in the 21st century. Is do the words of First Peter still ring true today? Yes, yes. Um, we understand that the Bible is inspired by an eternal God that, that spans uh, the, the, the scope of time, so to speak. He knew what we would need now. He knew what these believers would need then. It is an eternal, everlasting, it's a living hope for us. Okay, so... What does Peter do? Well, this book is really written as an epistle, and it's written so that this letter that Peter writes would not just be read by this church that he sends it off to. And by the way, it's not even addressed to a specific church. It's just addressed to these, these Christians who are in these different regions. So as the, the Christians who were gathered together in Pontus, verse 1, read the letter then they probably copied down the letter and then they passed that letter on to the folks in Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. It just went from, from place to place to place to place. Now, why was it that these churches were in these places? Because they had a good missions outreach, a good, good missions program, and they really believed in church planning? Well, I don't necessarily doubt that. But I think if we're going to be true to the, the idea or the context of the passage, I think we need to understand that the reason why these places are not just in Jerusalem or not just in a certain place is because they're being persecuted in different places and they're scattering out. And as Christians are going to these different towns and different regions, they're, they're starting these churches because they understand there needs to be a gospel witness in this place. And there needs to be a place where we can gather together as a church body. So does that give credence to the thought, the statement that we would say here often, and that has been a part even of our church history, our local church history, Trinity Baptist Church's church history, that the church is not a building, a church is a group of people. Yes, yes. And so to you people, Peter says, who are Christian people, in Pontus, and Christian people in Galatia, and Christian people in Cappadocia, and Christian people in Asia, and Christian people in Bithynia, it is to you that I'm, I'm writing this, this letter. Okay, so would these people be discouraged? Probably. There's probably a little bit of discouragement. They're away from maybe where they grew up, where their homeland is. They, they're not in the same place maybe where they were born and raised. And so it can be a little bit discouraging, can be a little bit uh, uh, frightening, so to speak. But notice what he says in verse number three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively, what's the word that he uses? Hope. A lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He does not say in this epistle, well, now that you've found a safe place, you can have some encouragement, you can have some hope. No. Well, now that you're, you're in a place where there's no longer persecution, I know it's not home, but you, you're able to be together with these people, and so because you're able to be together, then that ought to give you hope. No. No, the hope doesn't come again by, hello, morning message, by circumstances. 
The hope comes from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because of what God has done, these people can have hope, okay? So um, when a church is burned down, can a church still have hope? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, why? Well, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because of what Jesus has done, then we can continue on in our hope. So you mean that even if we stand strong on what the Bible says, and there's a possibility that in the coming days, we may go to jail for preaching the truth of God's word. Are you saying that we can have hope even in that situation? Well, yeah. Um, there's an epistle called the Epistle of Joy, and it's the one that we're going through in our adult science school classes. It's, a, it's the book of Philippians. And if we understand Philippians and we understand some, some um, Bible history, if you will, some, some chronology, we understand that Paul writes the epistle of joy from a Roman jail cell. Have joy, have trust, hope in the Lord, even when circumstances don't seem to be working out. Okay, so think about the day and time in which we live. Are there false religions and is there false teaching that is in the world today? Yes. Does the false religion and does false teaching, does that create doubt and confusion in uh, the world of even Christianity or the, the greater world of spirituality, if you want to use that term? Yes. Yes. Um, we are different than, and, and what we believe is different than what a Buddhist believes. Uh, we are different, and, and what we believe is different than what um, a Catholic person believes. This is not a Catholic church. Uh, we are different in what we believe. We are different in what we understand the Bible to say than um, a Lutheran church or a Methodist church or whatever. We have the name of Baptist. And not to tout that, it's just this is what we believe and because this is what we believe then that's the name that we have taken so that other people out there can understand okay we we get it we understand now where you're kind of coming from and hopefully that would be this book not um well we have a semblance of the bible but it's also what these people have said and these other books and then you need these books to understand what this book says no no that's confusion by the way, um, you, you study these other religions and other faiths, all of them seem to have some kind of a semblance or an idea of what heaven might be like, what paradise might be, or Valhalla, or whatever kind of faith you want to pick. There, in every one of them, there's this sense of ultimate ending, an ultimate nirvana, so to speak, an ultimate heaven, to use that phrase. But you understand in every single one, there's a different way to get there? There's, that to me is not easy. That's confusion. And so what Peter is saying to these people is, listen, what you need to, 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 to hold to and cling to is a common faith that binds us together. It is a lively hope that God has given to us because of his abundant mercy and because of his mercy and because of the power of the resurrection, then he has given us new life. He has uh, uh, given us, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he has given us a full and free salvation. Now, let's think about, just by way of introduction again, think about the people in which we might come in contact with, the agnostic or the atheist or even the, the unbelieving religious person. The agnostic will say that he cannot know for sure. I cannot know if there is a God. I cannot know if I have a, a real salvation. No one can know. The atheist might say, there is no God. The religious man, who, who's not a believer, but, but in some way religious, he holds to some kind of religious tenets or values, will tell you that he's trying. He, he can't be positive. He may even tell you he's not sure there is a heaven or hell or that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is even a literal historical event. He cannot know for sure. 
But what Peter says specifically in verse number three is that real faith in God's word provides a real hope, provides real encouragement, and provides real stability. Yeah, but these people were, were scattered abroad. Yeah, I know. But you're saying they're stable. Yeah, I know. Well, how can that be? It can't be both. I know. The stability wasn't based on where they were, circumstances, or how often they moved. Their stability was based on their faith in Jesus Christ. So real faith makes a real difference in your real life. And a church is a group of people who are gathered together around a real faith. Now, the word that Peter uses here, inspired, of course, by the Holy Spirit, verse number three, that word hope is a great word, and, and many of us have heard the definition before, maybe in some way, shape, or fashion, but just for those people had weathered the storm, they, they, they followed the crucifixion, they, they followed the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they were kind of a tight-knit group, if you will, and it started with 120 people, really, I think it started with the 12, grew to 120 people that are meeting on the day of Pentecost, and they had to learn to expect there's going to be some opposition to your faith, to the way that you go about things. Now, they leaned on the Lord. There's no doubt about that. They also leaned on each other to get through those fiery trial times. And so there's this close bond that is formed as they're determined to carry the gospel now to the ends of the earth. Uh, Acts chapter number 2, look at verse number 1. Acts 2, verse 1. Here's a description of that, that first church. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. All right, that, that original 120 group. Acts chapter number 2, look at verse number 44. And all that believed were what? Together. And had all things common. Verse 46. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Now, uh, look back at chapter number 1 and verse number 8. Acts 1 and verse number 8. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts, uh, part rather, of the earth. Okay, so we're all together we're of one accord. We're, we're fellowshipping together. Man, it's a great existence. We, we love this place and, and we love it here in Jerusalem so much so that we came here and we got saved and we settled in this place because we want to be a part in this, this church. And, and Jesus has told us we're supposed to leave this place. <laughs> we're supposed to start where we are in Jerusalem and go out to the kind of the, the next region around us, the region of Judea and Samaria, and then unto the uttermost parts of the earth. It's like a, it's a daunting task. How are we going to take care of this commandment from, from the Lord? It's like, man, we don't have enough energy. We don't have enough people. We don't have enough organization to do this. But do you think that their God was already ahead of them? I do. Do you know what he uses to get them to spread out? Persecution. Look at Acts chapter number 8, if you would. Look at Acts 8, a couple pages to the right. Acts chapter number 8. Look at verse 1, Acts 8 and verse 1. Here's our man Saul. Saul was consenting unto his death. That is the death of Stephen. At that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which is at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of where? Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Okay, so do you see that the very same places, I'm talking the very same places, that Jesus said you are to go in Acts 1.8 were the very places that God had spread them to and scattered them to in Acts 8 and verse number 1. How did he do it? Through persecution. God used the endangerment of their lives to evangelize the world. Persecution moved these people from their location, but guess what it did not do? It didn't remove their message. Look at chapter 8 and verse number 4 of Acts. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, whoa, preaching the word. 
So God says, all right, we need to break this up. <laughs> this is a great place. But you need to not just stay here. You need to go out from here. By the way, that should be the message of this local church. Okay. <laughs> Might have to go a little bit longer if we're not going to stay along, keep along with us. That should be the mission of this local church, just like it was that. This is a great place and we love it. But we ought to go out from this place. All right? We ought to go out from here and we ought to be sending people out from here. <sighs> I'm, I'm not trying to use them in any way, just as a, a way of an example. But, you know, when our Bible college students are done with college, most of them go back to their home church and serve in their home church. They go back and, you know, serve and, and are there. You know what most of our Bible college students do? They're not here, I can tell you that much. You know what they're doing? They're in other places. Serving their God in those other places. Now, I can be frustrated about it and I can say, oh, woe is us. Man, everyone else gets their Bible college students back. How come we don't get ours? And I can be tempted to do that. You know why? Because I love them. And man, they, I, I think they do a great job. <laughs> you know what? The Lord says, hey, Bubba, you know where they are? You need to pray for them because they've got little campers who they're overseeing. They've got people that they're ministering to and witnessing to and praying for and helping and all of those things are taking place because they're going out from their local church. I guess I better not whine and complain about it then. And I am thankful that there are many that go out from this place and they serve in other places and I'm, I'm thankful for it. And, and if we're not careful, we can get pretty callous to that and say... Why don't we keep some of these kids home? Why don't we keep some of these people here? I'd much rather be a place that is obeying the gospel and sending people out from here than it is this just becomes some kind of sanctified museum for other people. I don't want that. God used persecution in the book of Acts to, to spread the gospel to where he had told them to go. Look at Acts chapter number 11. Skip back a, a couple of other pages, maybe to the right. Acts 11 in verse number 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians. Whoa, Gentiles. Preaching the Lord Jesus. Verse 21, they shouldn't be doing that. Oh, really? That's what you think. But the hand of the Lord was with them. And a, I love this, a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. We might say it this way. A present tense trial doesn't seem to make sense. But a future tense trial understanding, those always make sense. In other words, if I understood here that this persecution, this fiery trial, this struggle, this, well, to use the morning message again, this storm is not just about right here, it's about maybe three years down the road. Maybe five minutes from now. I don't know, but God certainly does. The fiery trials never make present tense sense, but they always make future tense sense. Because I can't see the future. I, I fear what the trials might bring in my life at this time. But God sees out farther than I do. And so if he's bringing in my life, I can trust him that what he's doing is always what is best. And so what does he do to these people? Scatters them out. Hey, you need to go out into other places. And as you're going out to those other places, then you need to preach the gospel in those places also. So back in 1 Peter now, 1 Peter chapter number 1, look at verse number 1. As a part of this scattered family, 
Peter is writing to really what is, first of all, an unknown audience. He doesn't maybe know everyone that's involved here. Verse 1, chapter 1, 1 Peter. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the what? Strangers. The strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. There, there's no doubt that Peter is writing to Christian people in this letter. And while he calls them strangers, he identifies them, verse 2, as elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit. Now, don't get scared by the word elect. All it means is God has chosen them, by the way, from the foreknowledge of God the Father. He already knew they would be saved. He's already selected them. It's not where he determined that they could only be saved. These others would not. We, we would wholeheartedly reject that. He's writing to Christian people. Now, scholars that I've read and different uh, commentators, some of them only think he is writing to Jewish believers. However, I don't think that's the case. In fact, if you look at uh, chapter number 2 and verse number 9... Peter speaks to them as uh, those called out of what? Darkness into his marvelous light. Chapter 2, verse number 10. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. You see that? That they're unconverted days. Chapter 1 again, verse number 14. Their unconverted days are described as being in ignorance, is what the word that, that Peter uses. Chapter number 4. The first four verses there are chapter number four. They are warned that their old heathen practices from which they had been delivered, those things, you don't go back to those things. Those are wrong and wicked. Well, a Jew's not involved in those things. First Peter 3 and verse number six, the women are represented as having become the daughters of Sarah through their conversion, not through their lineage. What are you saying? Oh, I'm saying all these things point to not just a Jewish audience, but also a Gentile audience. I think there are both Jews and Gentiles that Peter is addressing here in this passage. We, we've all been saved from, from different backgrounds, from, from various places and, and backgrounds and, and, and upbringings, so to speak. Every Christian, we mentioned it again this morning, every Christian can go through different types of trials or different types of persecution or different types of, of problems or storms. So regardless of where we've been, regardless of where we come from, regardless of what we look like, regardless of what present trial you're going through or you just got done with, this book is written for our learning. Why? So that we all... Jews, Gentiles, anyone and everyone that's trusted in Christ, so that we all might have comfort and, verse 3, a lively hope. We know 2 Peter, or 2 Timothy, rather, 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. All of it. For what? Well, for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. What is that good for? Well, that the man of God may be perfect. Truly furnished unto all good works. This crowd that Peter is writing to, first of all, is an unknown audience. But then secondly, he says in verse number two, though you're unknown, you're a unified audience. Again, verse two, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Okay, so if you come from a different background, but yet you've come to know Christ as your personal Savior. He's forgiven your sins. You're, you're relying, trusting wholly in Him for your salvation. Does that mean then that you become in the same family as other Christians? Yes. Yes. Regardless of who you are, where you came from, regardless of what you have done. Wait a minute. I got saved when I was four. I didn't commit all the sins that, whoa, that guy did over there. I know, still the same family. <laughs> because y'all were still made clean at the cross of Jesus Christ. That, that's the equalizer here. And so that's why like, we, we look at things like 
these shootings and what motivates them or, or demonstrations and, and racially motivated acts or whatever, acts of hatred. We look at all that and we would, we would strongly say that the Bible denounces all of those things because it is not about the color of my skin. It is not about where I come from. It is about what Jesus Christ has done for me. And if he has saved me, then he makes me all the same family. So we can say things when we meet another Christian on the other side of the world, and we can say, small world. Because we're part of the same family. I didn't know that person. I know. Got a letter from, from uh, Brother Rudine, this, the, in fact, just this morning. He was able to lead somebody. Lord just got baptized last week. Guess what? I've never met him. He's my brother in Christ. Praise the Lord for that. I'm grateful for that. He lives in Honduras. I live in Austin, Texas. Well, Maynard, Texas is where I live. But he's my brother. And I look forward to the day when I get to meet him face to face because of what God has done for us. And so Peter is saying, I know you're scattered abroad. I have never met most of you. But guess what? We're all together. We're all part of this same family, so to speak. We, we feel at home with God's people anywhere. I remember visiting Ireland. We, we thought possibly the Lord was maybe calling us in to be missionaries overseas. And so we took a, mi a mission trip, a survey trip to Ireland, and we sat around the home of a missionary and just got to talk with, with other Christian folks who were part of his church there. And uh, couldn't understand some of them. <laughs> what? Could you slow that down about 33 and a third instead of 78? Because that's what you're running at. But yet still, we're the same family, the same group. I love what Jesus said, John 1 and verse number 12, but as many as received them, received him rather, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 17, 11, Holy Father, this is Jesus' prayer. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. John 17 and verse number 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. We're not talking about getting together by ecumenical means. We're talking about coming together because of the one common faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Unknown audience, but a unified audience. Third, he says, verse 2, you are an unmovable audience. Because they were strong-willed, strong-hearted, they just dug in their heels? Nope. Well, then what made them unmovable? Well, thank you for asking. Look at verse number two again. First Peter chapter number one. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. You're saved through sanctification of the Spirit. Unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. This crowd was often on the move. Why? Because persecution is coming. It, it's, it's almost like it chases them down. Persecution comes their way, but their position in Christ is solid, unmovable. It, it doesn't change. It, it's a joy to know that, that regardless of my location or my circumstances, nothing ever changes in my position as far as Jesus Christ is concerned. If I move from Oregon to Texas, guess what? Still a Christian. <laughs> yeah, but you're a better one. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. If I go from here all the way around the world and I'm preaching in Nepal, guess what? Still a Christian. Because of what Jesus Christ has done. That's what Peter is saying. It doesn't matter if you're in your homeland or not. All that matters is what Jesus Christ has done for you. He has made us all one. We are unmovable in our position in Christ. Someone can take your life, but they can never take your salvation. Praise the Lord for that. Circumstances change. Location changes. Wealth changes. Health 
changes, but we are eternally a child of God and that never changes. John 10, verse 28, and I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. John 6, 35, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. By the way, this is just after he fed the 5,000. And he's using that as an illustration. Hey, I gave you physical bread. I'm the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. 2 Timothy 1 and verse number 12, here's what Paul would tell Timothy, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Whether you believe it or not, the Bible is still true. Eternal security still means eternal security. Once we are saved, nothing can destroy my position in Christ. Now, I want you to turn to a passage of Scripture, and we'll finish here. We, we could have turned here this morning, but I decided to save it for tonight. Look at Romans 8. Romans 8, we've mentioned this several times before. It's, it's likely not a surprise to anybody or new to anybody, but Romans chapter number 8. Let's just read what Paul says in Romans 8, beginning in verse number 35. Remember the disciples out there in the boat? Fearful? <laughs> We've been rowing all night. Zoinks, a ghost. What's going to happen? Where's the Lord in all of this? Well, look at Romans 8 and verse number 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Do you know what a rhetorical question is? That's a rhetorical question. In other words, the answer is obvious. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword or a bank account that says zero or a you know, storm that comes up on the Sea of Galilee or whatever, name your little storm. Shall that separate you from the love of Christ? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, how many of these things? All these things, we are more than conquerors because we're strong. No. Through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. That's the stuff you worry about that you don't even know about yet, but you still get an ulcer about because you're so worried about it. And you don't even know what's going to happen. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what Peter's telling these people. I know it can be discouraging. I know you don't always know your surroundings. I know it scares you a little bit every time somebody comes knocking on your door or, or you hear their footsteps coming down your, your pathway because you don't know what that might hold. But I'm telling you this because of what Jesus Christ has done for you, you don't have to fear that. Your God knows where you are. He knows who you are. He knows what you're going through. You will be okay. The issue is not, well, as long as I have my little church. No, no. The issue is as long as you have Jesus Christ. Because one day you might be in a jail cell without your little church family, without your friends, without your family anywhere around you. Guess what? Jesus is still there. Still there. Still there. Job lost everything. His wife said, why don't you curse God and die? Basically, she's said, I, I can't deal with this. His father never left him. Father was still there. By the way, watching every interaction, listening to every word, that said, taking care of Job. You remember what God told Satan when, before he goes to attack Job? I'll let you do anything you want. He can't take his life. Do you know that Satan couldn't take his life? Because he didn't have power to do that. Praise the Lord. Who's in control? Your God is in control. Persecution comes. Tribulation's coming. I, I don't know if we're going to go through it or what's going to happen or I don't know if we're in the midst of it or all these things. 
Your God knows where you are. He's taking care of you. By the way, the Bible says you're not appointed under wrath. You don't have to pay for those sins. Jesus Christ already did that for you in your place. Praise the Lord for that. So yeah, you might be going through something and I didn't plan it out necessarily to line up with the morning message, but maybe the Lord knows best. Wait, rewind that. Always the Lord knows best. Yeah, I can trust him. He loves me. He cares for me. And so Peter would tell these people, you have a lively hope. You have a joyful and confident expectation of an eternal salvation. It might not always look like it here. But here, you never even have to doubt this. Praise the Lord for that. So then I can go out and I can witness to people in my workplace and in my neighborhood and, and people that I don't know. When I go out, you know, as part of maybe organized uh, visitation time, I can go out in those, thing, in those times and I can share a gospel track with the lady at the gas station or, or the, the person who checks me out at the grocery store. I, I can do that. Why? Because God enables me to do that. In fact, he wants me to do that. He says, son, I've given it to you. I want to give it to everyone. I want them in the family too. Let's pray. Lord.